So I am pleased today to present the next member of the Flamingo Project, Dr. Alessandra Merviani. She's a clinical lecturer in rheumatology at the Center of Experimental Medicine and Rheumatology, Queen Mary University of London. Hello, Alexandra. Hello, hi everyone. Hello. So let me first tell a few words about you. Um, after specializing in internal medicine at the University of Novara in Italy, Dr. Alessandra Nerviani moved to Queen Mary University of London to start her translational PhD in experimental rheumatology, which was obtained in 2017. Uh, since then, she has been significantly contributing to the de delivery of numerous observational studies and clinical trials in the field in, of rheumatology, including the first European synovial, synovial biopsy-driven randomized clinical trial in rheumatoid arthritis. Dr. Nerva Nerviani is a clinical scientist interested in the study of, uh, of the pathobiology biology of the synovial tissue in inflammatory arthritis. She has a strong background of translational research from bench to bedside, has solid experience in in vitro and in vivo preclinical models of arthritis, has exper expertise in uh, ultrasound, ultrasound guided synovial biopsies, and is an author of more than 30 publications in the field of inflammatory arthritis. Uh, but before starting, Allow me, Alessandra, a question. So you are working at the Center of Experimental Medicine and Rheumatology. What the, the word experimental means in this con context? So experimental really wants to give the idea the, that we want to connect the clinic and the bench. So we really made this uh, bench uh, bed to bench to bedside and back our main uh, force and strength of the of the department okay. so it's not just experimenting on no <laughs> no we are not experimenting <laughs> <laughs> randomly okay thank you so thank uh, you the microphone is yours now thank uh, you welcome alessandra thank you thank you very much sasha for the um for the invitation and the introduction today so before starting this journey into the joint uh, i just wanted to give you a very quick uh overview of my personal journey so as sasha said i um, graduated in medicine and then specialized in internal medicine in novara in italy and uh, novara is the headquarters of flamingo um, and then when I finished in 2012, um, I was left with uh, lots of questions, um, especially about uh, autoimmune conditions and rheumatoid arthritis. And so I decided to move um, north. So the geography of my slide is very wrong. So I moved north and uh, I joined um, Professor Pizzali's group uh, here at Queen Mary. Um, because they were interested in really understanding more about the synovial tissue during inflammation. And, and um, for me, it was supposed to be a one year experience. Uh, and uh, after a year, I was left with more questions than the one that I started with. And so uh, I decided to stay a bit longer and longer. And today, 10 years down the line, I'm still here. So. Let's start our uh, journey. So if you have already um, attended any of the other Flamingo uh, webinars, so you have probably seen this slide and um, you have probably listened to um, something about how to build the different unit to finally have the synovium on chip. Um, so today I'd like to take a step back. So we will start from the RA joints and then try really to understand the, what there is inside it, the joint of, of a patient with rheumatoid, um, which in kind of inflammation, activation, and, and, and especially what we can do uh, and how we can use this information that the synovial tissue give us. So um, let's start from the beginning. So what is rheumatoid arthritis? Um, it is an autoimmune condition, which means that the immune system that usually works to defending from infection, from bacteria and viruses, 
um, for some reasons, it starts attacking yourself, and especially in patients with rheumatoid, it attacks the joints, and there is a generation of the so-called autoantibodies because they attack your own joints. Um, it can affect people of any age, although uh, there are two uh, main peak of incidence, so one between 20 and 30 years and one between 50 and 60. Um, it's a pretty common disease, uh, one in every 100 people has a ray, so it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. Um, it's more common in women than men, and then unfortunately we have no cure. Uh, although we have very good treatments and what we are doing, we are learning to use this treatment in, in a better way. So what are the signs and symptoms of RA? Um, so very uh, commonly, most of the times patients arrive to our attention with pain, swelling, and stiffness of the joints, and in particular, the small joints of hands. So these joints here, just call MCPs, this one here is called PIPs and the wrist. However, rheumatoid is not only a disease of the joints, it can affect other organs, lungs, eyes, and kidneys. Um, so nowadays it's very common the use of the ultrasound, which is this machine. So this is a probe uh, with a, a piezoelectric um, crystal that allows to send and receive sound waves into the joints and then transmit electrical signal to uh, the machine and then create an image on the screen. And so this is an image of a very inflamed um, MCP joint. As, as you can see, this is a very, there's a very thick um, tissue here with lots of red dots. And the red dots means that there is um, new blood vessels and in normal condition, it shouldn't be there. Um, these hands and these x-rays, uh, thankfully, is something that we are not seeing very often in the clinic anymore. Uh, and the reason is, and we learned uh, over the, the last few years that we really need to diagnose the disease very early and start the uh, treatment very early. And if we do that, we can prevent the progression um, and the, uh, the joint damage and the structural damage and the disabilities that uh, can come afterwards. So why does rheumatoid arthritis occur? Um, so this is a question that um, I've been asked many times and uh, unfortunately we don't have a final answer for that. So we learn uh, lots of things and uh, we have theories, um, although still a few gaps and we are trying to understand. This is why there's a lot of research on, on rheumatoid. So just to briefly summarize this, uh, this scheme here, there's a lot of things happening in what is called preclinical phase. So in this phase, um, patients, they, um, they, don't, they don't know yet that they will be patients and uh, the things are happening, especially in the peripheral blood. So there are some environmental factors that can predispose to the development of RA and uh, the most known is the cigarette smoking. And uh, um, the link is um, cigarette smoking um, favor the um, transformation of proteins, and these proteins become so-called citrullinated. And in patients with um, a specific genetic background, uh, this can help the um, generation of uh, autoantibodies recognizing this new form um, proteins. And uh, overall, what happened is that in the peripheral blood, that there is a so-called loss of immune tolerance, which means that um, there is uh, an activation of the immune system uh, against yourself. Um, if we look at the synovial tissue, so what's inside the joint, the synovial tissue is this uh, thin layer of, uh, of connective tissue that covers the joints. So if we look at what happened in patients with um, antibody, uh, like rheumatoid factors and ACPA, so the typical antibodies of RA, uh, but not any symptoms yet, um, we can see that there are no major changes and the synovial tissue is very similar to the one of healthy control. So something happened between the loss of tolerance and then the transition, the transition to the joints and the development of the arthritis. And here, we still have lots of questions. It's not sure why this is happening. 
but definitely once the disease is established and once it's the clinical phase and the symptoms, the synovium changes a lot. And uh, we will see how in a little bit. How do we treat rheumatoid? Um, so if you if you see here, so I, um, I I wanted to represent the number and really the progression that has been over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, by 20 years. So in 1988, for the first time, methotrexate was licensed and methotrexate is the mainstream treatment for rheumatoid nowadays. And 10 years later, the first biologic treatment, we really changed the, uh, the, the prognosis and the outcome of patients uh, was uh, licensed and approved for rheumatoid. And then in a 20 years afterwards, so until 2017, um, more than 10 of these biologic drugs came into the market. Um, and today we have more than 12 of these biologics. Uh, so lots and lots of different choices. And we have this new, uh, relatively new category of, of medication, which are um, um, chemical compounds, uh, but they are directed against something very specific. So they are not like methotrexate, which is the more general uh, medication without a very clear target. Uh, these uh, so-called targeted synthetic DMARs, what they do is really recognizing a specific, specific target and action them. So um, this is so pre-diagnosis. Of course, we use uh, analgesic and and, uh, and painkillers. After diagnosis, uh, we have all these drugs mentioned here, and they included these advanced therapeutics, which include biological and these uh, targeted synthetic DMARs. However. However, with uh, treatments come challenges, and uh, despite we have lots of, of different very good, very good medications, uh, we still have troubles uh, to treat patients. Um, so in the early phase of our way, the first medication that we usually uh, give to patients is methotrexate. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, although 50 to 60% of patients initially they respond very well, later on the number of patients responding decrease. And so we end up with an overall 40% of patients, they do not respond very well. And so there's a failure of this first line treatment in patients. And, and, and so we need to move to the next step. So the next step in the UK uh, is, uh, is one of these biologic agents uh, and uh, one of the available uh, anti-TNF, which are antibodies directed against this TNF molecule. Um, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule that causes lots of inflammation. Um, and uh, again, these anti-TNF, they are very good and powerful medications, but um, about 40 to 50% of patients still at some point stop responding. And so over time, we are changing uh, treatment, we are changing mechanisms. So the next step is to try something different, which is called rituximab, um, which uh, is another uh, biologic, but in this case, it uh, acts against the B lymphocyte. So different mechanism of action. Again, we are facing failure of this drug in about 60% of patients and so on. As you can imagine, um, the quality of life of patients decreases along this journey. And on the other hand, there is more and more toxicity and disability. And uh, we are recognizing today that there's also a group of patients that despite trying everything, they still uh, do not respond. And so we call them uh, refractory uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But there are even more challenges. So as I said, we have lots and lots of medications. And one may argue that maybe it's because we don't give these more powerful drugs since the very beginning of the, of the disease. So here is a, on the, on the right, it's a nice graphical way to represent these. And um, um, so the ACR20 and ACR70, uh, they are, um, outcome, so they are a measure of, of uh, the response to treatment. And the ACR20 means that uh, there is an improvement of the 20% compared to um, before starting the treatment, and uh, which is a very little improvement, because if you imagine if you have 10 swollen joints, it means that you end up with eight swollen joints, which is 
which is an, an, an improvement, but still, um, that means the disease is still quite active. And uh, the different color squares, they mean the percentage of patients that they achieve uh, response. Um, so the ACR70 um, is a 70% improvement, of course. So the green squares here, um, it's something that in normal clinical practice, we, we don't have. So nowadays there is no um, indication in most countries, as far as I know, definitely not here in the UK, to use any of these biologic, like TNF alpha, tocilizumab, abatacep, etc., in patients that they have not tried any uh, methotrexate yet. So the best uh, achievement, which is still only the 20% improvement, is anyway something that we, we don't really use in clinical practice. So this means that we really have lots and lots of things to do. And so one idea uh, that appeared a number of years ago, really, and, uh, and uh, Professor Pizzalis here was a pioneer with that and, uh, and other researchers in the world, was to um, think about rheumatoid um, as uh, the same thing that was happening at the same time in cancer. So really trying to apply what is called precision medicine approach. So instead of giving patients just uh, 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 one, of the, um, one of the biologic agents, uh, everyone to everyone the same in the same order, trying to understand if we could improve uh, this percentage by giving to each patient something um, that could work particularly well for that specific patient. So um, precision medicine, what is precision medicine, personalized medicine, stratified medicine? So you, you, you may um, have heard about these uh, various names, uh, reading uh, here and there. And um, so long story short, they are uh, different words to say the same concept. So it's the, really trying to find a medical model to allow us to identify and develop therapies um, with the aim to treat patients with the right drug for them. The first time, and therefore avoiding the cycling from one drug to the next. Um, in Europe, uh, they uh, like the personalized medicine more term, and uh, this appeared in the Council of the European Union script in 2015, and it's been included in the agenda of Horizon 2020. Uh, while the word precision medicine became particularly famous after the speech of uh, um, Barack Obama in 2015, um, and then the start of the precision medicine initiative in the US, which is still ongoing. So uh, there is really an interest uh, in, the, in the world to uh, implement this precision medicine in all the different fields of medicine, including in the field of rheumatology. So why uh, precision medicine, uh, why do we need precision medicine for rheumatoid arthritis indeed? So the overall concept is to try to move away from this trial and error approach that we are currently using and uh, moving towards a more rationalized way to use the medication based on, uh, uh, for example, uh, this molecular pathology, which means then we want to find biological biomarkers that they can help us in choosing the best drug for the patient. And so in this way, we will become able to really maximize the therapeutic efficacy of uh, the current available drugs, which means if you have a different patient, each of them with a different uh, biomarker, um, we will be able uh, one day to uh, apply a specific algorithm that will tell us and the patient A will respond much better to drug A or patient B to drug B. But also importantly, um, we will be able to identify a group of patients then for some reason they do not respond to any of these available medications. So there will be some patient um, E and, uh, and the drugs that we have today, they do not work. So we will be able to try to develop these new medications able to target those specific patients. So now, 
um, how can we achieve precision medicine in our brain? Um, there have been lots of uh, studies in the peripheral blood, uh, but most of them, if not all of them, been quite disappointing and really unable to give us uh, powerful uh, biomarkers able to guide uh, the choice of uh, the best choice of medication. So uh, there was this suggestion that the tissue is the issue, which is a quite famous uh, sentence used uh, in, uh, in cancer. And, uh, and, and so this is where we started to look at the tissue. So the inflammation of the synovial tissue is really the hallmark of rheumatoid, as we said before. So what's, um, what is this synovial tissue? Um, so it's this uh, usually thin layer of cells that covers the inner side of the joint. And uh, it, for, it is formed by a lining, which is this part here in direct contact with the joint cavity and the sublining. So in healthy condition, this lining is very thin and is usually formed only by fibroblasts and macrophages, um, while the sublining is formed by um, vascular, vascularized connective tissue and just some dispersed uh, macrophages and fibroblasts. So it's a very quiet tissue. But then once the disease becomes established, then is when we see the major changes in the synovium. And uh, the lining becomes thick and uh, still formed by fibroblasts and macrophages. But we know now that um, these, these cells are really trying to stop the inflammation to go through. But then when the, when the rheumatoid arthritis, when the, when, the, when the inflammatory arthritis starts, it means that this um, barrier is, is, is lost. Um, it's very interesting what's happened in the sublining. And here, historically, um, people thought that if there was an active inflammation clinically, so if a patient was coming to you with a swollen joint, then the features, the characteristic of the synovial tissue were very similar. But actually, this is not the case. And uh, this was a really critical uh, discovery. So we recognize that um, in patients, they look similar from the outside. So with uh, maybe a swollen uh, wrist or a swollen uh, MCP, as we said before, if we take a piece of tissue and we look what kind of cells are there, then we find at least three different um, categories. So one of these categories, we call it lymphomyeloid. And, uh, and then with this term, we mean that there are um, lymphocytes, B lymphocytes especially, and usually T lymphocytes as well, but also macrophages invading the sublining. Um, a second type is called diffuse myeloid. And in this case, we have lots of macrophages in the sublining, but not uh, B cells forming uh, aggregates as we see in the lymphomyeloid. And then we also recognize this so-called post-immune or fibroid. And in this case, as you can see here, there are really no much immune cells infiltrating. Uh, except for a few macrophages in the lining, which is which is normal. You can find them also in LC. Um, and so for this reason, it has been called post-immune because um, of this uh, very um, relatively scarce immune cell infiltration. Um, so a, an interesting and important um, step was also to look at the uh, molecular characterization. So the, with the histopathology, we can see the protein expression, we can see the different cell subset forming uh, the, the various pathotypes in the synovial tissue. But then um, later on, because of uh, thanks to new uh, and advanced technology and the possibility of, do, of doing a complete uh, sequencing of the RNA, even using small uh, amount of RNA taken from the joints, then we realized that we could reconstruct the same type of uh, pathotypes. So the lymphomyeloid, the diffuse myeloid, and the postimmune, also looking at the gene expression. Um, and not only, so this is a, um, a, a work uh, done by uh, colleagues in the US. Um, when you look at the different cell types, 
um, you realize that, that each cell type, for example, the B lymphocytes, is not just one single type, but there are plenty and plenty of different B cells in the synovial tissue. And the same is true for the T cells, and the same is true for the macrophages and fibroblasts. So this means that there is really a complexity of the joint. There's a different, cell in, different cells involved, and therefore lots of different interactions and mechanisms. So if the tissue is the issue and uh, we want to use the tissue to inform our uh, next step approach to patient, so how do we get the tissue? Um, so I'm playing here in the background an ultrasound uh, scan while we do a synovial biopsy. So um, the big improvement here was the ability to do um, minimally invasive biopsies, so which is a technique uh, with, a, uh, with a small needle and the use of the ultrasound to guide where the needle is going inside the joints. And so the ability of retrieving very small pieces of, of, of the synovial tissue, as you can see here, the needle now has just entered the um, wrist and is taking a little piece of, uh, of tissue, closing and then coming out. And, uh, and this, this uh, technique really allowed us to collect lots and lots of, of, of synovial tissues and therefore really improving the research of, uh, of biomarkers. And uh, um, we ask patients if before and after these biopsy things were much, much worse. And they, uh, and they said then actually no. So the pain, the stiffness and the swelling was very similar pre and post procedures. And uh, the, the vast majority of patients they were very likely or somewhat likely to repeat uh, the procedure. So it's, it's a safe technique. And, uh, and really in the, in the near future, hopefully this will allow to implement uh, this new approach uh, to the treatment. So what do we do after we collected the tissue? So this is what we do in our, in our center. Um, we collect some of the tissue in uh, formalin and then uh, uh, the tissue from formalin it goes through all this machine until it is included in paraffin in this block. And then the paraffin block is sliced with this machine, which is called microtome. And then the slides are mounted. And once you have the slides, then you can do your staining, your histological analysis, your digital image analysis. Um, and uh, uh, instead, other little pieces of tissue, they are included in, uh, in other um, um, fluid called uh, RNA later and all prep. And in this case, some of these tissues are used for single cell analysis, and some of these tissue instead are used for uh, RNA and all the molecular analysis that I showed you before. So um, if the tissue is the issue and that we have the ability to collect the tissue from patients. And we think that this is, help, this is going to help us in our journey toward the precision medicine in RA. So a, a very large synovial biopsy driven um, clinical trials program um, has been established um, in our center um, and uh, uh, with lots of uh, interaction and cooperation with, uh, with centers in, in Europe and around the world. Um, we really the final aim to uh, understand if and how the study of this synovial tissue can help us. So we have different studies, uh, some of them they have already um, finished and uh, some of them already analyzed, while others are still ongoing. And uh, each of these studies was really trying to look and target patients at different stages of the disease. So early arthritis, so before starting any treatment at the very beginning of the diagnosis, establish an RA. So when patients, as we said before, they stop responding to the first line of treatment and uh, before starting the second line. Um, and uh, so this is still, uh, this uh, STRAP study is still, the analysis is still ongoing. The study has finished, but the analysis is still ongoing. Um, and then moving forward, uh, those patients we, who becomes difficult to treat, so patients who have already failed, 
the conventional DMATs in the beginning, like the methotrexate, but also one of the first line biologics. And so um, we, this study has been analyzed already, and I'm going to show you some of the, um, some of the findings um, in, uh, in the next few slides. So overall, a large program to really try to address this, uh, this question. And um, especially um, um, now one of, these, uh, one of these studies, so the early arthritis now uh, also has been changed and uh, is going to include patients also with established disease, difficult to treat and refractory. And uh, really to have an overlook and an overview uh, of all of all the patients at any stage, and uh, and patients recruited in this uh, in this study will uh, um, will also be recruited for the flamingo. Um, so we have uh, um, we 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 will try to really inform um, the development of the joint on, of of chip on chip. So clinical trials, clinical trials are uh, complex um, and, and long. And uh, um, as, you, as you see here, um, from the idea, there are lots and lots of steps before we can start the recruitment. Uh, first of all, the funding, then we have to write a protocol, and usually the protocol must be uh, written and then approved, and usually things are not as good as they should be in the first instance, so they need to be changed. Um, there's a lot of, of documentation that needs to be produced and, and kept. Then we have to find the sponsorship to have the regulatory approvals, so including the ethics committee. And then finally, we can start recruiting patients. And now you may think, oh, the worst is gone. Um, but no, this is not the case because then things become even more complex. Now I'm not going to go in, into the details of this complex slide, but it was really to give, just to give a flavor of what's behind the, um, the, the conception and the delivery of, of clinical trials. So uh, the last few slides, I uh, wanted to summarize what we have achieved so far. So we have a big task, uh, but uh, we, are doing, uh, we are doing well in this journey. And uh, for example, we started looking at those patients at the very beginning of the disease, so we look at this uh, at the synovial tissue of patients within the first 12 months of disease um, who have not received any treatment yet. And we asked the question whether having one or another pathotype could change um, the uh, relationship with some uh, clinical variables. And here we saw that, for example, having a lymphomyeloid, which is the pathotype with a lot of B cells and T cells and also macrophages, was associated to having more active disease, more pain, more painful joints, more swollen joints, uh, more higher inflammatory markers. And this is pretty clear in the, in the table, in the table here. Although when we look at how these patients were responding to the medication, which in this case was uh, the um, first step, so the conventional synthetic DMARs, so most of them methotrexate, we realized that while the lymphomyeloid diffuse myeloid were responding a bit better, the post-immune, so the one with very, very few immune cells in the tissue, was more difficult to treat. So the next step was to look at, okay, what happened uh, later on? So the same, these same patients then were studied down the line, so 12 and 24 months after. And then we see that um, those patients with the lymphomyeloid, um, because of the very active disease in the beginning, they were the one more likely to receive biologics. So the second step uh, of the treatment in rheumatoid arthritis. But then interestingly, we also see that those patients, they were the one responding better to this um, biologic treatment, for example, with the uh, anti-TNF. While again, uh, this post immune uh, looked like they were the one not particularly good in responding to treatment. So, 
Um, and here is the, is the results of uh, uh, the study, the alpha array study, um, which is the, uh, one of our clinical trials looking at those patients who are uh, difficult to treat. So they um, failed uh, already at least uh, uh, two different lines of treatment and they still have active disease. So, and what we demonstrated here is that having um, more or less B cells in the tissue, it could make patients more likely or less likely to respond to a specific treatment intervention. And in particular, those patients with uh, um, B cell poor, so with uh, not a lot of B cells in the tissue, they were more likely to respond to a medication which was not the anti-B cell. Uh, called rituximab. Um, but also, uh, this is uh, uh, on the right, this is our um, most recent um, effort. So we try to understand if from the molecular point of view, there was something that could tell us if uh, uh, patients, they were in that category uh, of refractory, which means patients uh, who are less likely to respond to whatever medications we are throwing at them. And in this case, we found that um, having some fibroblast um, genes, so more fibroblasts and other immune cells, characterize these patients and we define refractory to treatment. And why this is important? Because today in clinical practice, uh, we don't have any agent um, targeting directly fibroblasts. So this means that uh, perhaps in the future we should think about novel treatment intervention dedicated to these um, patients. So finally, um, I, I thought to I thought to conclude this uh, webinar really thinking that the future is bright. Um, because not only we are, um, we are learning a lot from the study of the synovial tissue, and uh, we are learning faster how to really um, improve the treatment of our patients. And hopefully in the near future, we will be able to use uh, the tissue to guide uh, the choice of medications. But also with, uh, with the Flamingo project, we want to move uh, to an on-chip, uh, study, which means if we will be able to recreate uh, the individual synovial tissue and joint uh, on a chip, then we will have a great platform to test medications before giving them to patients, and also a great platform to uh, study and to understand the, um, and try new compounds that we are not using yet and see how the synovial tissue and the overall joints react uh, to these medications. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you all, of course, for listening today. And a big thanks to um, all people in my department, Professor Pizzalis, who is the head of the center, uh, Dr. Lilian Fussati, uh, GMAC, uh, who is uh, um, very much involved in uh, um, the Flamingo partnership together with uh, Luis. And uh, really a big thank to everyone, our collaborator, funders, Versus Arthritis, which is my uh, funding body, and of course to all our patients. Um, and thank you again.